Okay, so that is a very quick overview of event-driven applications using our event listeners and event publishers, and then message-driven applications where you get more fine-grained control by having a named destination, whether it be a JMS destination or an AMQP exchange and queue. Um, now what we're going to do is talk about how to manage some back-end processing. If you have an application that needs to, say, pull the file system or pull a database or um, based on some interval, uh, perform a query against a web service. So these are the types of things that are not inherently event-driven. What we want to do ultimately, and where we're going with this presentation, is to have those polling consumers also hook in so that we can have event-driven behavior so everything looks as though it's arriving as an event. In order to accomplish that, we need to have a scheduled task that's running the polar. We're going to begin by just looking at Spring support for lifecycle management. This is how you can start some process within your Spring application. This is also something that the context will recognize automatically. So it falls into the same category of inversion of control. The container recognizes any bean that implements lifecycle and will be able to cascade the start call on the context to the start call on the lifecycle, and the same for stop. Now, in Spring 3, we actually added a new extension to this called Smart Lifecycle, which has also a Boolean flag so that it can automatically start up uh, without requiring an explicit call to start the container itself. And this is really useful because you have um, processes like the message listener container or maybe your database polar that need to start as soon as the application is up and running. You don't want to have to manually do that. And yet, some of these things might depend on the order. Like we want the, the database polar to start only after the message listener container starts because there's some dependency between them. So for that, there's also this phased interface where you can add uh, the, the ordering. It's, it's basically going to treat the lowest number first on startup and then go in reverse on shutdown. It also provides a callback method for stop so that you can do a graceful shutdown, cleaning up whatever you need, closing connections that you need before it moves on to the next phase. Now, once you implement something as a lifecycle bean, it's going to be picked up by the container automatically. At the bottom here, you see file polar is just being registered as a bean. The container recognizes it. And when the start method is called, in this case, what we're doing is we're delegating to a task executor. The reason for that is that you don't want to directly be creating and starting threads within your application. There are a lot of reasons that you want to have thread management abstracted away from your application. The primary reason is probably if you're running in multiple environments or you plan on deploying into an application server where you are not supposed to be managing your own threads. Spring's executor, uh, task executor abstraction actually provides implementations that are based on plain Java 5, Java Util concurrent features like basic thread pools, but also has an implementation that delegates to a common J work manager. So when you're running in that type of environment, you can have the threads managed by the container, by the application server. So here we have the executor being injected. It's configured with the Spring 3 task namespace, which allows you to set the pool size. It also has attributes for queue capacity and for rejection policy and the other properties that are needed for a thread pool. So this is going to be a basic Java 5 thread pool that gets injected. And then the execute method is going to invoke that asynchronously. The reason that you would do this in your start method is that that process needs to run in the background. It needs to be asynchronous because we're going to trigger this while loop that's running repeatedly and pulling the file system. If you had that running in the start method without passing to an executor, then it would actually block the startup of the application at that point. Now, that seems like a lot of code still to have to deal with, with the executor being passed in and managing all of that. So for convenience, we also provide an annotation-based approach for this with the async annotation. With the async annotation, what's happening is it's generating a proxy, and the proxy will invoke this method uh, within a task executor internally. So it's going to look like the same interface that's been implemented, but when you call start on the proxy, it actually invokes the target start method within a task executor. So all we need to do in this case is add the annotation-driven element and point to the thread pool task executor that we want to use. So that covers just the basics of polling. However, rather than polling 
yourself in a while loop or based on some interval, it's much easier to just have a scheduler invoke your task at a certain time. This also allows you to externalize the configuration uh, to basically separate these concerns. The frequency that you want to pull doesn't have to be coded into your object itself. And you can write a more fine-grained method that is going to be invoked repeatedly as opposed to a method that has to manage a while loop um, and all of the complication that that, that can entail. What you're looking at here is uh, some new features of Spring 3.0. And the reason that we couldn't add this until Spring 3 is that it depends on the future, which is also a Java 5 um, component. So that was not available until we had Java 5 as a minimum version. Now, Task Scheduler has a number of methods. I'm just showing a few of them here. Um, you can schedule things at a fixed rate, at a fixed delay. There are also versions that take an initial delay parameter so that you can, you can you know, wait until 10 minutes and then run every minute. There's a schedule method at the top that takes a trigger. And that's the one that I think is most interesting uh, because it's going to be the most flexible, the easiest to customize. The trigger interface, as you see in the middle, is just simply uh, returning the next time that you can execute this given task based on its context. And context consists of when it was scheduled to run last, when it actually ran last, because often there will be a delay if there aren't resources available at the time it's supposed to execute, and then the time that it actually completed. So it might be a long running process. Um, it might take 10 seconds to run, so there would be a difference between the execution time and the completion time. And that's where things like fixed rate and fixed delay come in as well. We actually have two implementations of this out of the box. Periodic trigger, which allows you to do either fixed rate or fixed delay, and then also the cron trigger. Cron trigger takes a cron expression and will execute the task or will return next execution time according to whatever that cron expression provides. So these are both available out of the box, but as you can see here, it's very easy to implement your own custom trigger if you need to for some reason. Then we have the um, example here of our file polar being refactored to use um, scheduling. And the way that we do this, instead of injecting the task executor and having a while loop, we're injecting a task scheduler and just scheduling the task to run with a given trigger. This would allow us to have a configurable trigger that can be passed in separately. You can use this file polar with a cron trigger in one application and maybe with a simple interval-based trigger in another application. Also, you'll notice that it simplifies the way things work. The task is now a uh, encapsulated unit of work that is going to be more fine-grained the task can just pull the file system once and return the results, and we'll be able to execute that repeatedly through this scheduler. Also, stopping the task is easier. Rather than having to deal with some flag to end the while loop, we just call cancel on the task object, which was returned from that scheduler. And that's the scheduled future instance. At the bottom, you see the task scheduler using the task namespace, and the configuration options are very similar to the executor. We have a pool size uh, for the number of threads that the schedule this scheduler maintains. OK, and then we have the scheduled annotation, just like we have the async annotation. Um, here, what we're doing is we're, we're going to be, um, the container is going to automatically recognize anything that has the scheduled annotation, as long as you turn on the task annotation driven element. When it encounters a scheduled annotation on a method, it registers that method with a scheduler um, so that it will be invoked based on the schedule provided through the annotation. So again, file polar is just a bean definition. No extra configuration is needed. If for any reason you don't want to use annotations or you're using third-party code that you can't annotate, then there's an alternative to this. Um, as you see listed in the second point here, task uh, namespace also provides a scheduled tasks element where you can explicitly list out beans by reference and method, very similar to what we have with the message listener support in JMS, where rep would be some POJO and method would be the actual method you want invoked. And then you provide the scheduler information within the configuration file. Now, one reason people like to do that is that they don't want to have this cron expression or whatever it is uh, specified directly inside the code. Um, that obviously can be error prone. It can lead to duplication unnecessarily if you want to use the same scheduler in multiple places. Um, it also requires that you recompile the code every time you want to change that schedule. So there are a number of reasons why that's not a great way to provide the scheduling metadata. For that reason, we also provide this option, which is using the scheduled annotation as a meta annotation. 
All that that means is that it can be added to a custom annotation that you define, and then that annotation serves as its placeholder. So here we've created daytime as just an example. So this could be anything that makes sense within your domain. Daytime is annotated with scheduled, and then that's where the actual scheduling information goes. So we're, it's basically one level of indirection so that you don't have to put that uh, scheduled annotation directly on your code. We can reuse daytime across the application, and it's going to be using the same cron expression. Now, this actually takes it even one step further and moves that schedule into a property within a properties file so that it's externalized and can be um, modified without having to recompile the code. You could have the cron expression literally in the daytime annotations definition if, if it were fairly static, but this example shows you the maximum flexibility where it's being loaded from a properties file.